what's the low hanging fruit? Where do we start in making suggestions to help them optimize their lifestyle? First thing I would do is go, okay, where's your joy? Or find me one thing that you like doing that makes your heart swell. The other thing I do is go back to your childhood. If there's not been childhood trauma, go back to a joyous time that you had when you were a kid. Was it eating that weird ice cream at the ice cream parlor? Was it going to the candy store? Was it the roller coaster? What brought joy to you as a child and bringing them back there? It's all about replacing the behaviors. Welcome to Personalized by Vitamin Lab, the show where we dive deep into the world of personalization in healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. David Dizer. Please remember that the following discussion is for educational purposes only, and it's not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Speak with your healthcare practitioner first before integrating anything that you learn today. Join us as we explore the remarkable stories, breakthroughs, and possibilities that come with the pursuit of personalized healthcare. Welcome back to Personalized by Vitamin Lab. I'm your host, Dr. David Dizer. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today on the show, I spoke with Melanie Yarrow. Melanie's a registered professional counselor and a master practitioner clinical counselor. Melanie and I have worked together for many years. In fact, she spearheaded a cancer support group that we had in our clinic prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Melanie has expertise in addiction, both sex and substance abuse and misuse, complex trauma, loss and grief, pet loss, as well as chronic and terminal illness. She's a wealth of knowledge in these areas, and I continue to learn from her every single day. Melanie inspires me to be a grounded practitioner and an active listener. She has an incredible ability to create space for emotional healing to take place, which really comes through in our episode today. Please enjoy my episode with clinical counselor, Melanie Yarrow. Hi, Melanie. Welcome to Personalized. Hi, David. So nice to be here. How are you today? Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Oh, great. Well, we're happy to have you on the podcast. We're extremely passionate about individualized care on this show. We're, we're trying to promote the concept of personalization in medicine, in healthcare, and we're trying to speak to a wide variety of practitioners. And I wanted to speak to someone who has had experience working with people who have gone through trauma. And the first person to come to mind, of course, was you. We've worked together before. And I have a, a great respect for the work that you do. You're a, a clinical counselor and you've been working in, in practice for 15 years. Just about. Tell me a little bit about your, your practice as a whole and where your current focus is. So I, I began this journey about, well, 15 years ago, working mostly at the beginning in addictions, which I still do a little bit, but through the years, I moved more towards complex trauma, which mm. really is, you know, the umbrella for addiction. So that's what I do. I, I 90% of my practice is, is complex trauma and process addiction, which is a focus on sex addiction and sex trauma. Okay. How does one get into this field? You start out in, in addiction. Was that in Vancouver? Yeah, well, actually, when I when I was in school, my my focus was going to be in end of life care and cancer care, which is something that you do, right? It really is. And I did that for several years, and it was too hard on me. It was mm. it was too hard on my heart watching people die all the time. So I don't know how it happened. I was thinking about it. I ended up on the downtown east side as a volunteer um, at a residence working for Coastal Health. They ended up hiring me, and I was down there for a long time. Wow. And then I went and worked in men's treatment, addiction, and then I, I left and, and have been on my own ever since. It just, you know, it, 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 everything kind of just lands. You don't really seek out an area. I sought an area to work in, which is end of life, and it didn't work. And it, it, through a, a chain of events, I ended up working in addictions. I ended up on the downtown east side. I stayed there for 10 years. Wow. Wow. That's a long time, I would say, on the downtown east side. How does someone yeah. stay present? And as a practitioner in, in your field, how do you show up to work every day knowing that you're going to be speaking with people about uh, very intense subjects, topics, emotional yeah. releases that probably likely occur in every single chat? How do you do it? You know... Somebody asked me that the other day, how do I do what I do? Listening to these stories day after day, you grow a tough skin after all these years. 
And it's my work. It's what I do. Mm. It's I'm passionate about. It. I love it. I, I love, it's odd. I love listening to the stories. I love getting people through their story. It's hard though. You know, I have some days, I had a day last week where a parent of a old client called me, said, I have some news and I knew right away that she was going to tell me her son died. So you have these things that happen. I don't know. I've, I've, I've hardened up, I think, over the years. I still have a, a strong heart and my heart is open and tender. But when you hear the stories over and over again, they're just, they're stories. The hardest part of my job is not immersing myself in the story. Like, I mean, you know that, right? You hear the stories too. So keeping myself away from them, but still in them, mm-hmm. it's, that's a fine balance. Really hard to do. That is incredibly hard to do. Yeah. Some, and some days at the end of the day, I crawl up in a ball on the floor and cry my face off. You know, mm-hmm. it's hard work. It's hard work. And I speak to a lot of, of course, on this show so far and in my, in my professional life, I speak to a lot of integrated physician naturopathic doctors who experience burnout themselves because they really have gotten into their profession because they want to give their patients more time yeah. and better care. And they believe that um, the path they've chosen is, is, is the path to accomplish that. However, not taking the stories home with them has been incredibly challenging. And I know a lot of colleagues who haven't been able to create that boundary. Do you have any tips for them to create that boundary as someone who has had to have the strongest of boundaries? I do. I have some really good ones. So, you know, one of the things that I do is I have my own therapist who I see regularly every week, who's been my my rock. She's incredible. I'm so lucky. I have a clinical supervisor who, when I have a really hard case, I go through that with them. I'm also in a clinical supervision group. So just really looking outside for the support. Mm-hmm. I don't bring my work home. I have, I have something that I do. It's really interesting. Whenever I finish working with somebody, I go and I wash my hands mm. up to my elbows like surgeons do. It's kind of a ritual washing off that energy and coming back and doing the next one. But also being okay to ask for support. You know, that's, that's the most important piece when you're exhausted and you're hearing the stories. There has to be an outlet for them. So that's where I have my therapist. That's where I have my supervisor. And that's where I go, I need help. Come over and give me a hug or, you know, reaching out to friends, not being afraid to ask for help. You know, when we're in the helping field, I often, you know, speak to younger counselors or people who are new in, in this industry. And the one thing that they don't want to do is ask for help because they don't want to seem weak. But it's a sign of strength to say, hey, I can't do this on my own. I'm really tired. Mm, I hear you. I agree with that. Well, and right after, you know, the, the pandemic, I was working seven days a week. I was exhausted and it caught up mm-hmm. and I, I wasn't able to walk. You, I mean, you, you saw me throughout that. And, you know, one of the things that I see with people, with people in the helping fields is that they don't take the time to regroup and to stop and to go, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to take two weeks off. I'm going to cut my caseload down because, you know, we worry about money when you're self-employed, but, I can't stress the importance to stop every now and again and and take a week, take two weeks. The money will come. It always comes, right? Those are really valuable comments, Melanie. I I mean, I know a lot about this already because I know you well. But one thing that has inspired me since the first time I talked to you about your practice was this ecosystem that either you or your profession as a whole sets up to support each other. You know, uh, uh, what you've unpacked there for us is that you have your own counselor and you have, did you call it a supervisor? Clinical supervisor, yes. So somebody who's been in practice longer than I have, who has more experience, who I can bounce my cases off of if I'm having trouble. And a supervision group. And a supervision group, mostly new clinicians, which is so Mm -hmm. great because I learned so much from them. You know, you've been, when you do this for long enough, you get a little, not burnt out, but it's kind of same old, same old. But then Mm -hmm. you have somebody new who's so excited to be doing the work. And it's like, I hear the passion and it reignites my passion for the work that I do. It's been inspiring. Yeah, it's super inspiring. I see that as an ecosystem, right? For for not only for self-care, but for professional development. And I would love to have something like that in the integrated field. People are so busy. You know, people are so busy and so stressed about seeing as many people and helping as many people as possible. But I think what you're getting at there really is that if you're 
burnt out, you can't help anybody. And no. we need to we need to set up these tools so that we can be, you know, the best versions of ourselves. What was this ecosystem idea or sort of the the three pillars of support that you have? Is that something that was ingrained kind of in your profession or did you seek those out? Well, you have to have supervision to get your designation. You need X amount of hours under supervision. Otherwise, you can't you can't become a member of the association. So in British Columbia, we're not regulated. We are going to be regulated. So anybody can call themselves a clinical counselor, but you, you can't become just because you're doing the work. You have to have the hours to become a member right. of the association. And that way you get covered for insurance. So okay. if I'm not a member of a clinical association, I can't get coverage. Right. Okay. That makes sense. For my clients. So we have to have supervision. You have to. Is it, do you have to have a therapist? No. <laughs> I choose to have a therapist. It costs me a fortune because mm-hmm. I need somebody. I listen all day long. I need somebody to hear me. I, you know, just because I'm a therapist doesn't mean I don't have stuff. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. We all have stuff. And then the supervision group, that's part of the required hours per year. So every year to keep our, our designation, we have to have X amount of clinical supervision. It could be one-on-one or it could be in a group. I do both because I like to learn from the young kids. From the young kids. They come in and they're stoked to do the work and they go like, call me in 15 years. (laughs) Right, right. Absolutely. No, I'm still stoked to do the work. I love, I love, I love, I love what I do. But there's days where I'm like, oh, God. There's days. There's days. (laughs) There's, you know, you have those days. Oh, God, again. For sure. The the second point you brought up was the ritual and having this discipline around conscious separation between the conversation you've had and your personal life. And you do the washing of the hands. It's so smart. I haven't thought of that at all. The arms up to my elbows, just like a surgeon like go, goes in to scrub before surgery. That's right. what I do. And I envision getting the stuff off. That way I can go in fresh to the next one. But I I very, very rarely go back to back to back to back. So I have time to kind of regroup and do my notes. Yeah, smart. It's it's that clinical efficiency that I think is the lack of clinical efficiency. I think that drives people to lose out on that type of discipline and that type of ritual. Like when you're at the end of the day and you have 10 charts you need to do and you know, you're going to do them until you're totally toast. And then maybe you don't get that ritual that one time, you don't get it two times. And then you've lost out on this separation. And then all of a sudden, you're bringing everything home. So you have this ability to stay disciplined in that practice. And that's inspiring to me too. Well, thanks. You know, something I learned is that we're trained, you know, our sessions are 50 minutes. My sessions are never 50. They're usually an hour plus. But they're 50 minutes, so in case you're going back to back, you got 10 minutes to do your notes. And I've trained myself over the years to be really efficient. And when I finish, I do my notes. It takes mm-hmm. five, 10 minutes, then I have the next one. I used to let them pile up. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, oh my God, I got like 10 caseloads that I got to write about. I do it all at once. Well, good work. Well, that's excellent. The third thing you mentioned was on, this, on the self-care side was really about being able to seek and ask for support. And I really think yeah. that on the, on the practitioner side, we need to be the people who have maximized the tools available for the thing that we're working through. So when I'm thinking about VO2 max and helping someone become as fit as they possibly can, I want to see if I can maximize my physiology. It's not always possible, but continually thinking about working towards that. It sounds like you're doing a similar thing by having your own counselor, seeking support, and making sure that your mind is right and your emotional regulation is healthy so you can be supportive. If I don't take care of myself, I can't take care of anybody else. Not that I, I don't take care of anybody, but I, ha- I have to be on the ball, 100% present. And it goes way beyond, um, way beyond seeing a therapist. It, it, it's about sleeping properly, not drinking, taking care of my body, taking, taking care of my mind, being in nature, doing all the things to support my whole system from my mind Mm -hmm. to my heart. I spend, as you know, live in two places. I live in the country when I'm not in the city. 
I need that. I need the quiet. And what I see from a lot of younger counselors who come out into this field is the go, 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 go. See as many people. Don't take care of yourself. Because people get so excited to do this work. It's such great mm-hmm. work. And then, I mean, I, I was guilty of it also when I started. I went and I went and I went. And even during COVID, I think I was seeing 40 people a week. Oh, my goodness. That's not sustainable. You can't. Right. I was working seven days a week. So the importance of self-care, not only for a counselor, but making sure you're you're sustaining your body with nutrients, proper nutrients, no processed food. Like mm-hmm. I do have those conversations with my clients. What are you eating? Mm-hmm. Are you eating processed food? Because you're not going to, your brain is not going to function properly. Your gut is not going to function. I'm not a genius. Like you're the doctor, right? And that's why I send you so many people because I can't do your work. But it all goes hand in hand. If you're not taking care of your body, then you can't take care of your mind. So getting outside, exercising, doing, you know, doing the normal things, not sitting in front of a computer. It's so important. And, and just in everyday life, not just my clients, I see the people I hang out with, people aren't taking care of themselves enough. Mm-hmm. And that's why people are burning out and not being able to do their work. That's why people come to see me because they're not taking care of themselves. Definitely. Let's bring that full circle when we discuss the holistic approach. Uh, I'm going to bring that back around because you made so many good points there about a holistic approach to this cognitive and emotional and and, uh, mental health, mental wellness, and the physical body being so important. So let's come back around to that. But before we get to that, let's go through some of the frameworks. Let's say you're working with someone who has experienced trauma and they're in your office for the first time. Do you have a set of frameworks? Do you have a path? that you take them down to fully be able to hear them and experience their story in the moment? What is the sort of the framework for assessment that you have? I don't do that. Um, Before somebody comes in to see me, they get a couple of forms, they get a consent to treatment form, and then they they get an intake. So I have a rough idea what's going on when I read that and when I speak to them for the first time. I don't come from a directive lens. I just kind of open the bowl and let them fill it with whatever they have to fill it. Everybody's different, you know, depends what the trauma is. It depends what's going on. I just want to create the space and and allow them to share when they're ready to share. Trauma is quite tricky. We don't push it. We don't ask questions. We just, I create space. Create space. And that's the hardest part is just creating that safety where they feel that they can speak. Especially like with with something like sex trauma, I you know I always know what's going on, but we don't ask questions about that. We say, well, where did it happen, and who did that to you? We just wait for them to disclose, and sometimes it takes a year. Mm-hmm. But it's just it's just it flows right, and mm-hmm. and sometimes you know people come in with a presenting problem. Let's say, you know that they're having insomnia, they can't sleep, mm-hmm. and because they're so stressed. There's always something else under underneath it. There's a mm-hmm. which you, I'm sure you see also. They come in with one thing, but then the can of worm gets open, and you know the story. The story mm-hmm. unfolds. But there's no particular process for each person that I go through. No checklist. No. No, I'm into that. I'm totally into that. You know, part of that my experience has been in trying to take a similar approach, but not being an expert, is having difficulty with silence and being maybe unable to create the space sometimes. How do you create the space? How do you accept the silence and let them direct the conversation? That's the first, one of the first things we learn is how to sit in silence. So I remember when I was in my, doing my studies, I was actually paired up with somebody in a room. They were sitting in a chair face to face and we weren't allowed to talk to each other. Are you kidding? We weren't allowed to say a word. Oh, that's torture. Well, that's what you do. We're, we're not supposed to talk. We're supposed to be able. So, you know, there's, there's things we do. We don't sit with our legs crossed. We don't sit with our arms crossed. We open our bodies in a welcoming mm-hmm. way, right? So if I'm sitting like that, who's going to want to talk to me? <laughs> and over the years, I've had one person say, that's really weird to be so quiet. I said, okay, we'll say something. Only one person. One person. <laughs> and And I stare. <laughs> I don't put my eyes down. I keep connected. And I've never heard people say that's uncomfortable. They feel warm. They feel held. 
Wow. Well, I could see a lot of value for integrative practitioners and naturopathic physicians to go through some of this sort of training. Maybe it just would require some work to be able to develop that kind of skill because when you're working with the physical body, it often leads to this area where, you know, thinking about digestion, for example, so often we're talk- we end up talking about stress. We end up talking about some event that impacted them negatively that maybe set off the digestive change. Yeah. And I, I find creating that space, and I think a lot of people find creating that space quite challenging. Why? Why? Because, you know, as a fixer, you want to get to it. <laughs> That's the trick. We're not fixers. We're not fixers. We're not supposed to be fixers. We're helpers. So I think that's a really important point about individualized care, right? Whereas is that we're helpers. And, you know, when we when we take this approach, we can pull out what's actually required by working as a team with the person in front of us. And so I think that you do it really well. Do you have sort of treatment tools or could you walk me through what a, a, a take home message or a take home treatment type would would be for someone who maybe has had complex trauma, for example? So what I what I see with with that is nervous system dysregulation all the time. Like I, I can actually see them outside their body. It's the wildest thing. Meditation is my go to. Absolute meditation. Excellent. And do you use the word meditation? Mm-hmm. I don't care what it looks like. Um, you know, I have my own practice. I love the app Insight Timer. That's my go-to for everybody. Get on there. Do 15 minutes a day, the same thing every day. Get out in nature. That's the big one. But the meditation tool is quick and easy. It's like it's on your phone. It's right there. For someone who, let's say we're talk- speaking with a practitioner who's working with someone who's had trauma, and, and you know, maybe they're not the one fully supporting them on the mental emotional side like you are, but if they're trying to inspire a, a regular meditation routine, do you have any tips for them? Do you have a specific type of meditation that you would say choose on Insight Timer or do you leave it rather open? I, I ask people to start slow, 10 minutes, because sitting is hard for people. Mm. And using a guided meditation, not just sitting with a nature sound because that's really hard to focus. But the 10, 15 minute, the same one, just keep it on a loop and keep doing it. And eventually they'll get it. And it's a beautiful practice. It's my own time when I sit, it's my own time to regulate my own nervous system. So yeah, 10 minutes at the beginning. And I started people in 10 minutes and then I get calls. I just did 20 or I just did Mm. 30. I'm like, keep going. Amazing. It's not a hard practice. Like if you sit down with, I'm going to meditate for an hour, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But if you sit down for 10 minutes, find somebody's voice that you like. I have one woman. I love her voice. I listen to her every day. What type of meditation, what what type of guided meditation are you most interested in using to support people? What, what, What is it? What is it like? Could you share with us exactly which one it is as well? The one that I really, I love is Yoga Nidra for sleep by Jennifer Piercy. Okay. It's 22 minutes and you do it at night. You can do it anytime, but it's meant to be done before sleep. And she starts at your crown and works through your body, makes you connect with each part of your body, re-regulates the nervous system. I see dysregulation. I go into that app for 22 minutes. Call me, let me know how it worked. Oh, I'd love that. People who can't sleep, they're sleeping with it. It's amazing. I'm I'm taking notes because I'd like to try that one. Oh, good. Yeah, it's a great one. The other thing is um, to re-regulate and calm the nervous system is get off the phone an hour and a half before bedtime. Don't look Mm -hmm. at a computer screen. Those screens add so much stress to the nervous system. Absolutely. Like people who are sitting in front of their screens. Yuck. So I have my habit. I don't look at my phone for two hours before bed. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I won't look at it. I won't look at a TV. Oh, I don't have a TV, but I won't, I won't watch a movie at night. I just don't. I can't sleep otherwise. So can we get into what drives people to do this type of thing, even though they know it's bad? Let's say we're working with someone who's experienced trauma and they're, say, overeating, or mm. they can't get off their phone at night, or they can't get the discipline 
to exercise on a regular basis. Can you walk me through what your experience has been with this type of resistance and <laughs> the inability to take the steps that maybe would be supportive of healing? Million dollar question. I'm laughing because like I've asked myself the same thing over the years. Like, what do I do to make this person do the work? Nothing. Not my journey. I can't do anything. I have one young lady who I'm working with and I'm like, I've been working with her for years and I've, I've, I've got her so far and she's amazing. And she won't do this one thing. She's stuck. Mm -hmm. And I said, like, what can I do? She says, I don't know. I said, okay, when you're ready, you're ready. And that it's not my journey. So all I can do is really hold space. Sometimes I go, okay, like, what do you need from me? What do you need from me to move forward with this? Or what is the blockage? Sometimes they don't know. I don't force. I just hold space. Okay, when you're ready, we'll do it. You're not ready yet, that's cool. Vitamin Lab revolutionizes personalized supplements, empowering health practitioners to create tailored supplement formulations that address each patient's unique needs. Bring personalized health to your practice and choose from over 200 professional-grade ingredients to create vitamin formulas that improve patient adherence and result in tangible outcomes. All ingredients are sourced from the world's most trusted suppliers, and Vitamin Lab provides hands-on support to help you formulate and launch personalization to your patients. Say hello to a new era of personalized supplement solutions. Go to getvitaminlab.com slash personalized to save $100 off your first formula. I think there's, there's treatment value in the fact that you tell them and communicate that you're holding space. Like, now you've inspired me. Now I've got your, now I've got your voice in my ear. Right? That's going to say, hey, when you're ready. I've just heard it three times, when you're ready. You, we can't. I mean, I've been resistant to things in my life. And when I'm ready, I'm ready. Mm. Right? I've been trying to learn this, this instrument for three years. And it's really <laughs> hard. And I finally sat down and I was ready. You know, my teacher was like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you learn this? I don't know. And I finally was ready to learn it. And I'm learning it. So wow. you, we can't force people especially with trauma, right? You know, that's it's like, I'm not opening that can of worms because I'm going to die if I tell you my story. I've heard that line before. I bet. It's like, you're not going to die. I promise you're not going to die, but it's going to be hard. Definitely. I bet you right? have. I, I work mostly in chronic disease prevention now. So I have a quite a strong focus on health span and lifespan. And I'm trying to think about long-term wellness in a holistic manner. And I think the mental emotional body is an incredibly important part of that you want to actually be able to be present and feel good as you age in a healthy way. But part of the the difficulty for me has been supporting people who have had difficulty losing weight. And the reason being not because of metabolism being low, which is something I, I find a lot. But in, in this patient population, maybe just the drive to overeat. And the cozy feeling, the safety feeling that people receive from being with their favorite foods. And even if it's maybe not taste, but favorite because of routine or habit. Um, have you seen this in your practice and have you worked in, in this space very much? I don't, I don't work in, in that area at all, really. Um, but interesting, I, I have a friend of mine who can fit well. He finally confessed that he's an, a food addict. And that's the first part. And he's been struggling with this for, he went from 700 pounds to 400 pounds, and he's three. Whoa. He was actually invited to do a reality show, and he didn't. And it's a, there's a big trauma piece there. And he's not ready to talk about that trauma piece. How do I support people? You know, I... I work mostly with young women in their 20s and 30s, and I've seen a lot of body dysmorphia, but it's more with the younger generation, I'm seeing what's happening is they have so much access to nonsense. Mm. So they've got the Instagram and the Facebook and, you know, all this bull, and that influences them a lot to stay stuck in their patterns because they want to look like the supermodel on Instagram. It's very sad what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing out there with, with young women, young men. How do I get them out of it? It's time. Mm. 
again. Yeah. And that that's the hardest part of this job is it's not my journey. And I have to always keep remembering that all I can do is hold space and guide somebody. But if they're not ready to take the step, if they want to still overeat, I, you know, I've, I've, I work in addictions, right? So food addiction, it's addiction. Why are they overeating when they know it's not good for them? Mm-hmm. It, habit, laziness, or society is a very lazy society, right? And it's the comfort of a bag of chips. It's the comfort of a bag of chips. Until somebody is ready to take comfort in a pear or an apple, they're going to mm-hmm. take comfort in the bag of chips. All we can do as practitioners is let them know that they're loved, they're supported. Their choices aren't exactly the right choices that, you know, I would pick for myself. And I've said, you know, I wouldn't do that for myself, but if that's your choice and I support that, when you're ready to make the change, let me know, call me. I don't care if it's nine at night, call me and we'll talk. I overextend myself like that. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten the calls late at night going like, I'm ready. Okay, cool. I'll see you Monday. No, see you tomorrow morning. (laughs) Absolutely. If somebody's ready after they've been resistant, I'll see them on the weekend. I don't care. I'm so stout. Now I'm now I'm piecing it all together. Now I'm piecing all together. You're creating space, allowing people to let you know when they're ready, and venturing towards that moment by having them tell their story and open up. And slowly. Slowly. So I see that Slowly. with like, let's let let's say food addiction, right? Let's say food addiction. And they come to say someone like me to have their metabolism test. And we measure metabolism. And it's normal. And that tells us that they're overeating. Now we have to go down this journey of creating a meal plan, right? Creating a some structure that is a deficit, some healthy deficit that's very subtle so we can maintain muscle right. and achieve our goal over a very, you know, sort of long period of time. Now it's my job, and this is where I'll be needing to refer to you, to try to pick out those moments of, I wouldn't call it weakness, but those moments of seeking comfort in food. And maybe by your example, it's not my job to pick out those moments. Maybe it's my job to create space so they notice those moments. How do you communicate that? Are you doing a lot of talking? I don't talk a lot. I don't talk a lot, but something like... You're just efficient. Well, it'd be like, I point out the science. You know, I'm noticing that your metabolism is is working perfectly. Do you want to talk to me about what you're eating every day? How's your water intake? No, you don't want to talk to me? Okay, when you're ready to let me know and have that conversation, I'm here. If you're not ready, that's cool too. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a, it's a hard one. My friend is just after all these years, says I'm a food addict. And that's the first piece. Right. But you, you can't say, oh, you're a food addict or you got a problem with food. You, you can't. Yeah. No, you can't. One thing that's helped me, I think it would be journaling. Has, has journaling been something that you use? Like we journal diet diaries mm. and then we say, oh, OK, so here's what we have found. Um, and th- th- I guess for me, that gives them a space to kind of tell their story in writing. Is that something that you do? I don't do that kind of thing. I do I do something else. I started doing it when I worked on the downtown east side out of the blue. I call it the accomplishment book. It's been highly successful. Every day, I want them to write one thing. It's a, it's a two-part piece. Day one is one thing that you did that day that made you feel good about yourself. It could be when you have clinical depression, getting out of bed and washing, brushing your teeth could be anything like that. And the next day is tell me something, write down something that you, that you like about yourself. So day one, something that you did that day that made you feel good about yourself and something that you like about yourself. So if I'm working Mm -hmm. with somebody who's has body dysmorphic disorder, which I don't really get, but I get a lot of self-esteem, low self-esteem. Tell me something about yourself. Who are you? I have seen in the years that nobody knows who they are. So really getting Mm -hmm. down, who are you? What did you do today that made your heart feel yummy? Oh, Mm -hmm. you talked to a stranger on the corner. How was that? Write about it. And it's just one line. And it's been incredibly successful. I've gone from 
really low self-esteem to like lifting up and being able to get dressed and go out and get a boyfriend. I have one girl who she just wanted a boyfriend so badly. So five years ago, she's getting married, but she, she didn't know who she was. She could not. And it's, I get the calls. I can't do it. It's so hard. It's really hard to go inward and find out yummy stuff about you. We don't, we don't stop to look at ourselves ever. Right. Who are we? So that's mm-hmm. that, that. It's been so successful. It's amazing. Oh my gosh, I love it. I'm gonna I'm gonna start using it. It's so good. It's so good. I I have never considered that. I, I have a similar question in my intake form that I typically don't ask when working on deficit nutrition plans. I, I for some reason it's not part of my my questioning. But but during a typical intake, we would say like, "What do you do for fun?" And over the years, over the last ten years, I must have had you know a hundred people say, "Oh, I have no idea." When I, I'm telling you, I get calls going, I don't know who I am, or I don't know what I'd like. Like, I can't do this. It's so hard. It's just write anything then. Just, and it starts to flow. And I, I have one girl, a new girl. She's 20. She's so lovely. She couldn't do it. She called me crying. I can't do it. So I will do that. Do it with them. I do one. Mm-hmm. They do one. And we do like 10 together. And then it gets the ball rolling. But things like, I really like that I'm a kind person or mm-hmm. I really like that I show up vulnerably and it's the things I hear. It's like, Oh, it's so delicious. I love it. Yeah. Right. For sure. And you get to know them that way. And it, when they get to know themselves, that's where the change happens. Definitely. Yeah. Getting to know themselves. With a food issue, let's say somebody who's overweight and they can't lose the weight. It's so important for them to find the yummy stuff about them. Right. Because they're so down that they can't get that weight off. But when they start seeing the beauty within them and start pulling out these things and writing about them, that's when the change happens. It's amazing. Definitely. Okay. I'll, I'll send my bill. You're going to get yeah. charged for that tip. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, sorry. <laughs> I I'll pay it. I'll pay it. That's fine. I'm, I, I need to build an accountability program. I think part of integrative practice and, and naturopathic practice is staying in touch. You know, we, we just crossed over 6,000 patient files. Like we, how do we create something where people can check in and people can feel like there's progress and experience that progress, but be self-guided. And it sounds like you have that on lockdown. And so I've been considering what would an individualized accountability program be knowing that, you know, not everyone needs the same thing. It doesn't sound like you use this tool for everybody. But you know when it fits, right? And yeah. that's the algorithm that makes you so successful. Like, here's the fit. This is the thing. Insight timer and this or this and this. And that's the complicated part of practice. And that's why we want to do this podcast. Like, how do we actually individualize care? And it sounds like you have a, a good handle on that. Do you have anything to say about individualized care, about maybe how you develop this handle? Are you? just so in tune with what people, I guess, need or let them, because you let them take you in the direction that you're able to individualize care because of that. Any comments about that? Yeah, something I do, and I'm going to admit it. I I have really shitty boundaries. (laughs) Okay. In a sense where, you know, if somebody is struggling at eight o'clock at night, they can call me yeah. and I make it really clear. Like nobody, when people come to see me, I do trauma work. So people are in it. I don't, you know, see people going through divorce. I do the deep, dark stuff that most clinicians really don't like to do. And when somebody's disclosing and opening up and vulnerable, I don't want them to think that they have no resources outside a session. My own therapist does that with with her clients too. And I think because of that, and not every clinic clinician or healthcare practitioner will do that. Most don't. But my success has been because of that extra step that I've taken along the way to support. So mm-hmm. they people that work with me know they are never on their own. I often hear, I don't want to call you because I don't want to bother you. It's like bother me. I don't want you to do this on your own. And that's where the magic happens. They feel held. A lot of people don't have family, their parents, whatever their story is. I want to be that one that they feel safe with, that 
they know that if they're in trouble, they can call me. Not the best. Did you learn that the hard way? Did you learn that you, that was required? Or did you know coming into your profession that that was something you were going to be doing? When I started on this journey and when I became a clinician, I never wanted to be the kind of clinician I saw growing up. I come from a very severe trauma background, as you know. And I didn't want to sit with somebody who had a notepad and who was sitting like this. I, I wanted that warmth. I never got that. And I decided that that was my mandate to, to be like mama bear, be warm, be open. It was just, it's the way I work. It's not for everybody. And we're, you know, we're not supposed to be as warm and kind as we are, as I am, but we do. You, you do. And that's the kind of care I, I, I give. If you could give a piece of advice, just to build on that a little bit, if you could give a piece of advice maybe to your new grad self, you just came into practice and you know, you're know you trying to support yourself looking back, what would you tell yourself getting into practice? How would you support yourself? Hmm. I knew you were going to ask me that question. Self-care. Self-care. Hmm. I wouldn't do anything differently except more self-care and less caseload. Because, you know, I was at the beginning, I just saw anything and everything, and I don't anymore. I, I'm very specific on, on who I take in. I like that. The self-care piece right away. So important. You know, you're not the first person to say that, but the way that you've expressed it, I think, is quite quite powerful considering the work that you do. So I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, you know, one thing, one habit that I see a lot in practice, and we touched on it a little bit when you were telling me about your holistic approach, the way that you're thinking about supporting the mental emotional body is sleep. And we talk about sleep a lot in this practice. I think the delaying of sleep onset by being on the phone for people who have incredible stress or major depressive disorder, even people who don't, who are trying to optimize their lifestyle, it's a problem. Um, what type of things are, are you seeing? Are you seeing people pull all nighters when we're doing what we call doom scrolling. Are you seeing a lot of this type of uh, delaying sleep onset and having to deal with the consequences? It's not really scrolling, but it's more of, you know, we're so used to having that thing in our hand all the time. And it's, it's retraining people's brain, helping them retrain their brain to put the phone down. What, what I've been doing with people is that they can't have the phone next to their bed that the phone stays out of the room or it stays across the room because what happens is they can't get up in the morning. So right. the alarm gets set and then the snooze button goes. So the, the phone is on the other side of the room and it's just a matter of working with them to retrain their brain. Mm. I was going to get that timed locked box. There's a box that you can purchase that it has a <laughs> timer that locks. My wife was like, this is silly. You have more discipline than this. You can leave the phone in the other room. It's like, okay, you're right. That is silly. But there are tools out there for that that could be supportive. Yeah, no, I, have, I haven't had that big problem. It's, it's more, it, it's that light, the blue light on the phone, yeah. you know, and on the screens. It messes with, with the pineal gland, right? So mm. get the phone away. Don't touch the phone for two hours at night. And it's, mm. you know, it's, it's just... The younger people, it's their life, right? Instagram is their life. They're on the phone all the time. It's the world that we live in. What can I do? Do you think it's another a point of comfort? Or do you think it's more of interest in trying to not experience boredom? I don't think. I think it's just a habit. It's, it's just some, it's, it's like having a growth on your body. It's there. The phone is there. It's a habit. It's society. It's what they're saying. You get into it, right? I, I've had to break my phone habit, got into like the scrolling thing at night. I was like, this is dumb. I'm going to read instead. But it's hard. It's it's hard. When was the last time you went out for dinner? I was out for dinner a couple of nights ago, and I was sitting next to a table, six people, and they were all on their phones. Oh, goodness. I couldn't yeah. believe it. I got up, and I said, and I took their phones, and I put them in the middle of the table. I literally... No, you didn't. I swear to you, I literally did that. I said, you guys are all up for dinner. What are you doing? And they were all 20-something. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. It's yeah. just mind, mind-numbing. One thing I'm seeing a lot um, that, or, or that I think has a significant influence on people's psyche is the possible mind expansion 
that is available because of all the inf information online, but going t but that expansion taking a person down the wrong road too much for them in the moment. Am I seeing that too? Too much information. There's too. It, it's not expansion. It's like it's momentary expansion. All oh, the information. It's like at your fingertips, but. At the end of the day, it's it's dumbing people out because it's too easy to get the information. So, so their minds aren't expanding. They're actually contracting. We know that since COVID, IQ rates have deviated down four points. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's a fact. It might be five even. They did a study on children. Hmm. We're wearing masks, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That makes sense to me. How does this impact someone with trauma, being exposed to the world's information or what may be described as accurate information that might not be accurate online. What does that do to someone with trauma who is, you know, experiencing everything that they're experiencing? Dysregulation. Further dysregulation. Like wild dysregulation. Really hard to, to get them reintegrated. Mm -hmm. Really, really, really hard. And I, that's why I tell people, don't watch the news. Just Get off, don't watch it. Don't go onto Facebook, don't read that stuff, just limit yourself. So I titrate. So it's just with addiction, what I, I work on harm reduction model. Mm -hmm. I don't work an absence model. So same thing with the process addiction, like sitting on your phone and scrolling. Okay, let's get you down to an hour and a half. Mm. Put, put those parental locks on your phone. I put parental locks on phones. You have done it for them. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> let's get a lock on your phone. But really, like titrating down, okay, you can scroll for half an hour. I And I have one guy who I work with. Um, he's in dental school now. He's an amazing kid. But to get him to dental school, I, I actually put a parental lock on his phone, and I had to speak to his parents. We had a meeting saying, he's not going to go to dental school. He's spending too much time on his phone. I look at, because you can see how much time you've been on Facebook, or you can see that if you have an iPhone. I mean, I looked at mine a few weeks ago, and I was like, yuck. I don't want to go on yak. I don't want mm -hmm. this thing anymore. Yeah, that real life data can be quite eye opening. It's wild. Oh, that's a good tool too. I've talked on the show a couple times about doing the same thing with sleep, with REM and deep, and looking at the quality and quantity of sleep. But I never considered it for assessing the usage. Thanks about the sleep. I because of you, I look at my sleep now every day. Hmm. It's helpful. It's so so helpful. But, but the same thing, look at your usage. It's, it's wild because you think you're on for five minutes here and two minutes there and nine minutes here. It accumulates, right? And it's like mm -hmm. 40 hours at the end of the week of Facebook. That's not okay. Mm, I could see that being a, an important part of the harm reduction model. You know, we do the same thing with uh, smoking cessation, right? We try to separate the cigarettes from the habit, you know, separate from the food, separate it from oh, sleeping and exercise. And, and then over time, you know, the, we're able to get to a place where there's a big enough separation that there's nearly zero. But doing that with the phones, I think, could be incredibly helpful. And it sounds like the parental locks is a good way of achieving that. Well, yeah. But so th the thing also, like with, with bad habits, like be, finding comfort in a bag of chips, is we want to look at those behaviors and what can we, with a food addict, what, what are we going to change the behavior to? What are the joys in your life? Find me one one golden nugget that can can change that can shift you away from the bag of chips. So, what are some of the some hobbies that you like? So, I had one one guy in the other day who is unfortunately a substance user, and said, "Okay, we're going to titrate you down. What are some things that you can replace that behavior with?" So he says, "Well, I'd love to play tennis. Okay, okay, once a week you're going to play tennis. Then we're going to get you to play tennis twice a week." So we're just, we're looking with food. Okay, instead of the bag of chips, what else can give you the same sensation that's more more suitable for your system that's not going to block mm -hmm. you up? Oh, you like salt. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's a salty food that's not like laden in fat? You know, so we're just like, we're, we're changing, we're switching, we're replacing or adding in something. Definitely. Oh, that's a smart approach. The replacement. Can we go to back to the, the health aspect, the holistic approach to improving mental, emotional wellness. Mm -hmm. When we first started chatting about this, you were talking about digestion and sleep and exercise. Can you walk me through 
you know, you're working with someone who's been through obviously something traumatic and it's come to a place where they're ready. What's the low hanging fruit? Where do we start in making suggestions to help them optimize their lifestyle? I, the first thing I would do is go, okay, where's your joy? Or find me one thing that you like doing that can bring, that makes your heart swell. Mm-hmm. The other thing I do is go back to your childhood. If there's not been childhood trauma, go back to a joyous time that you had when you were a kid. Was it eating that weird ice cream at the ice cream parlor? Was it going to the candy store? Was it the the roller coaster? What brought joy to you as a child and bringing them back there? And repl- it's mm-hmm. all about replacing the behaviors. I love that. When, when, my, when my grandmother was passing away of cancer, she made this off the cuff comment to me that I was so, I was so taken by. It. She said, you know, you need to never stop playing basketball. And I was like, okay, I won't. Thank you, man. And that was one of the last things I remember her saying to me. And I, I've been, I tell people that story a lot because I think it's, you're right. It's incredibly powerful to recall the good, you know, let's take a step back. When did you feel your best? And can we go back there for a moment? And with sports, it's easy, of course, because for me anyways, because that's my, that's my experience. But what other examples could you share about, about that? Let's say someone didn't have trauma in their childhood and we're asking them to go back. Would you, would you give direction? Or are you creating space and allowing them to find that moment? You know, a lot of people can't find the moment. They just can't find the moment. And, and that's okay, too when they're ready to find the moment, but it's, it's like one little thing, like even thinking about a moment in nature that made them feel safe. I often bring people to the forest when we're working, we do some visualization of that. We want to find one nugget that they're safe. And once they're safe, then I can expand it even more. But until I hit the safety button, nothing's, I don't do anything. I would love to, know about just to bring us sort of like full circle we we're talking about personalization and i haven't asked you about one key question that i like to ask everybody what is one thing about you that is completely unique that not many people know about you you know people are surprised when i mean you know me well so you know how sensitive i am but when you do this kind of work you have to have a stiff upper lip but i'm like this little puddle of goo at the end of the day i i'm very very sensitive and i think because i do set i don't want to blow smoke up my butt but i do good work and the reason i do good work is because i connect on such a deep level with the people i support and i cry with them and people are surprised when I cry in session and I don't stop myself because it's a human. If somebody's telling me a sad story, I, I'm, I'm going to feel it. And that's people are really surprised when I tell them I cry with my clients or my clients see me crying with them. And they're like, I've never heard a bad thing about it. It's like, thank you for crying with me. Being like, wow. hi, I'm hypersensitive. Mm-hmm. But I can see the value in that. You know, if you're working with someone and you're being vulnerable already. I can see that there's power in that. And uh, I have respect for that because that's that, that may not be the easiest thing to do. It might be a natural reaction for a lot of people to try to restrict yourself from doing that. But this, this is not a natural reaction for you. No, we're taught don't cry. You know, that's one of the first things. Don't cry. Don't cry with your clients. Don't tell them anything about yourself. Do it all. There's some personalization for you. Well, I mean, if you're if you're sitting with somebody, you don't want to be a stranger. Mm-hmm. If they're telling me their whole life story, I'm not going to tell them my life story, but I'm certainly going to share a relevant story if it's going to support them on their journey. Mm-hmm. That's human. Fully hear you, and 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 on that human aspect, we should leave it today. I I got so much personally. Yay. out of our chat together clinical tools for myself but i think the viewership Yay. will also uh, receive tons of benefit for um their their practice even if they're not working in, in trauma care we all will experience that person who's gone through something so severe always and so the tools that you've shared i think will be incredibly helpful and i'm really grateful for that if someone's watching where can they find 
more about you? Where can people connect with you online? My website, www.melaniero.ca, Y-E-A-R-O-W.ca. And are you doing both in person and online currently, Melanie? Mostly online, but I, I will see people in person. Incredible. Well, thank yeah. you so much for the discussion today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hope you have a great day and we'll talk again soon. Nice to see you, David. Thank you. See you. Okay, bye. Thanks for joining us for today's discussion. What about today's podcast resonated with you? Be sure to tag at Dr. David Dyser and at Get Vitamin Lab. If you're learning from and enjoying this podcast, please let us know by subscribing to our YouTube channel and follow the show on Spotify and Apple. And don't forget to leave us a review. It's the best way to support our podcast and it helps others find us. To learn more or book a demo to explore what personalization could do for your practice, please go to www.getvitaminlab.com personalized.